Digital Marketing Radio, episode 172, using psychology to build a great website. DigitalMarketingRadio.com Digital Marketing Radio is part of the 3B Podcast Network. UK casters talking business growth. Find out more over at 3BPN.com. The big interview with Baby Bay. I'm joined today by a man who built a brand, Learning People, from an unknown entity into one of Europe's largest online training providers. He's now set up his very own digital marketing consultancy based in Brighton, England. Welcome to DMR, Steve Linney. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on the show. Always a pleasure. Yeah, great to have you here, Steve. And uh, you can find uh, Steve over at uh, emarketing.co.uk. Um, and that's without the vowels and the word marketing. <laughs> Yeah, I've also, if you want to go to insanelygoodideas.com, that will take you to the blog section of your marketing. So it's, it's probably an easier one to explain. Okay, okay. <laughs> so um, um, who stole your vow, Steve? Um, yeah, well, that's the problem these days when you're doing a new brand, isn't it? You know, there's kind of all the good names or the, all the good domains are taken. So it's kind of a, yeah, I was kind of late to the game on that one. But thankfully, I got insanelygoodideas.com. So go there for instead. Insta oh, ins insanelygoodideas.com. Okay, so um, that's, that's possibly a better one for audio listeners in the podcast. Yeah, yeah, it rolls off the tongue a bit better. Um, but, but maybe the fact that, that we're actually talking about your brand makes people remember it even more. So maybe it's a good thing. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully. I mean, to be honest, it, it, the name does work for me. And, um, you know, it kind of sums up what we do as a company, you know, because it is, is e-marketing. It's just it's not an easy one to explain when you're saying what the URL is or ty to type out, um, uh, you know, your email address. You always have to kind of spell it out sort of thing. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're talking about using psychology to build a great website mm -hmm. today. So... Why do you actually need to be thinking about psychology when you're building a website? Well, to be honest, you have to think about psychology, to be honest, in any business, really. And when I'm kind of talking about psychology, I'm not meaning that we try to trick some, someone into doing something. But what you're doing is you're designing the website in a way that is kind of pleasing to people's brains in a natural uh, process. You know, the, the, we all like to think we're individuals, but, you know, we're, we're kind of hardwired in a certain way that, um, you know, there's things that are pleasing to us and kind of get our dopamine running. Um, so it's just you need to kind of have your website um, ticking those boxes and kind of really pushing those uh, neurons, essentially. Dopamine, is that not one of the drugs that um, is banned from the Olympics? Or um, yeah, but it's, it's naturally occurring as well, though. <laughs> um, so how do you know actually about the thought process for your users? Um, how, how do you actually go about doing what you suggested there well to be honest um there's a couple of really great resources that i've kind of used to kind of that kind of really kind of set me on the path towards this side of things and, and I, I really need to kind of um give a lot of credit to webs of influence by natalie naki which is an absolutely amazing book and it kind of it kind of put a light bulb on in my head and how you should be using a website and how you should be talking to people um you know it's simple things of having the correct color on your logo the correct color on your call to actions the placement of the call to actions how your eye flows through a website it can make mass massive differences and you know there's natural things you can put in place that um are just pleasing to an eye and um, give people a sense of trust um you know and it's it's one of those you, you don't really need to reinvent the wheel in many ways you just need to kind of understand how that kind of wheel goes around um and another book that i kind of really uh, recommend is uh, called Quirkology by Richard Wiseman. And this isn't a, a marketing book by any means at all, but again, it shows you how we act in certain ways. Um, you know, for example, there's no such thing as luck and lucky people just tend to be the people who try more things. They probably get a lot of things wrong, but um, eventually they get something right. And then, the, so they're naturally perceived as being lucky. And there's also a thing as well where apparently you're more lucky if you're born in, in the summertime than the winter time. And it's a difficult one to kind of really equate, you know, with a, a British summer, is it summer, is it winter, what have you. But, you know, my kind of guessing around that is, is maybe by the time you're, you're one year old and actually, you know, we have a one year old who was born in the summer and we can, I can really feel this now in my head, how this could actually be what Richard was talking about. 
but you know you kind of you, you're not coddling them in clothes as much you're kind of letting them kind of run around and be their own little thing you know so maybe that gives them the confidence when they're later in life to kind of just get on and try things because they've not been mothered as much so, so i was born in january are you saying i've just got no hope well, January in Scotland and July in Scotland, you know, it's kind of a... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm July baby in Scotland, so it's always, always rains in my birthday, so... <laughs> yeah, so I don't know where that goes, so, to be honest. <laughs> I, I loved um, the way you started off there, talking about different colours as well. You know, I've um, been involved in um, the creation of different brands and mm. be, been aware of, obviously, uh, different websites that you can look at to discover what different shades of colours mean and why certain industries um, tend to navigate towards using certain colour palettes. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, as an overview, um, would you say that um, certain colours are, 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 are big mistakes generally to incorporate within logos generally? Well, well you, you, I couldn't answer that generally. What you, you need to bring it back to is who your target audience is and kind of what you want your brand to represent really, to be honest. Um, you know, if you are going to be a kind of a bargain basement, um, you know, 99 pence shop or website, you know, yellows and reds together go fantastic. Um, if you're Apple and you're selling really expensive uh, tech goods, yellow and red is not good at all. But, you know, white is very, very good because it's a, it's a very kind of calming color, you know, um, one color that I kind of really like to use, particularly in logos, um, and you can see that in the Learning People's logo and in eMarketing's logo, is uh, the color blue. And you'll probably notice that um, the vast majority of banks and the, the kind of um, FTSE 100, you know, think of tech giants as well, such as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all kind of use blue because it's um, seen as a trusting color as well. Um, and for me, when the, when you're kind of talking about psychology, really, it's kind of, it's getting to the bones of making someone trust in your brand, really, to be honest. And for when it comes to colour, it starts with the blue of the logo. And I also use blue throughout websites as well, maybe as a kind of a, a background colour, although that can be a bit kind of heavy duty in places. Um, but other colours that are kind of very good for that side of things as well, it's kind of green as long as it's used in the right hue. Um, talking of hues as well, actually in saturation, it's, it's the age of your target audience you kind of need to keep in mind as well. So if you're um, older, you prefer more pastel colours. If you're younger, you can kind of like it a bit brighter on that side of things as well. So yeah, so it's can, there's definitely no one answer for that. It's know your target audience. For me, it's about bringing trust in and it's about bringing in conversion rate. You know, so you're kind of optimizing that experience on a website. So you really need to, again, also get down to the individual outcomes of a website or an outside outcomes of a brand. You know, are you looking to kind of generate leads? Are you looking to generate sales or boost your, you know, your revenue growth? And then think about how you want to stand out against your competitors as well. Um, talking of the learning people, I used to like to use the phrase that we were... Um, you know, we're kind of like a, a British Airways or an Emirates side of things, you know, so we want to kind of look like a, a high quality brand where um, you know you're going to get good customer service, but, you know, you, you may pay a little bit more for the training, but the training was of the good quality and you're going to get the service to go with it. Whereas, um, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but other training companies we say, oh, they're the easy jets, you know, they can, they can have that side of things, but we're going to, this is how we're going to, you know, position our company, essentially. Just look for the training providers in orange and we know the ones you're referring to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost said the name, but I would. <laughs> so um, is it important to involve your prospective customers in the design of a logo and, and a website to get their feedback as well, or, or is that not really necessary? Well, it's kind of there's you know there's kind of two, two I suppose you've got two hats in that really to be honest, and you know it's kind of um, you know it's good to kind of get opinion as as wide many you know as, as many people as possible, but I also think that too many cooks kind of really get in the way of spilling the broth and other analogies like that, but it's so where I think it's good to get kind of customers 
um, input is really getting to understand that kind of persona process. So really speak to uh, potential customers and current customers and lapse customers when you really want to know who your personas are. And then you kind of feed your kind of your brand identity around that and also feeds the way that you kind of deal with your customers, um, you know, how you're going to communicate with them. Uh, what you're going to be talking about, you know, what really makes them tick, what do they like, and more importantly, what do they not like. Um, but I wouldn't really want to get as granular as kind of, um, you know, choose this color or choose this logo. Mm. It's not to say I haven't done a Facebook competition in the past where, you know, we have said choose this logo. Um, invariably, they choose the one that you don't want. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 I suppose you've got... Uh, if you offset that against and you get some really good viral traction and it really pushes your brand, fantastic. But, you know, chances are that won't happen. So it's going to be more about taking that um, educated guess. But definitely, you know, get your customers information involved and expertise, you know, survey the, the, the life out of them at the persona stage, really, and get them to understand what how you want to talk to them essentially and your okay, so will come from that it sounds like it's more about um getting your profile of your ideal customer right to begin with and really understanding who that is and if you yeah, yeah. do a great job at that then there's probably no major requirement to actually involve people in the design phase because you've got too many people involved then and to a certain degree you just need uh, one or two decision makers and it, it can go a little bit crazy if you if you have too much input yeah i mean that, that that's my kind of experience with it to be honest i'm sure the some another person would talk about focus groups being kind of really handy for this side of things but for myself um perhaps it's the control freak inside of me who would prefer to have that kind of yeah an, an input of um intelligence before and then you kind of come up with the idea from, from that and we're talking about the psychology behind what users do in a website do you find that that is different depending on the device that they happen to be using i mean if someone's using a tablet versus versus a mobile device or a desktop pc um do their um perceptions or um wishes for what that website will offer change depending on the device that they're using um again i think that's going to be dependent on what your website does and what it delivers to be honest um i think you know their expectations don't change in that people always kind of want to know what's in it for me essentially what the experience they're going to get from the website or the app on that device um but yeah it totally does need to be kind of digestible on every platform um and probably kind of a good example of that um is when you're thinking about things like such as apple tv these days where um you know netflix can be quite a straightforward experience although i think it's actually quite a bad designed website from a psychological point of view because there's too much stuff in there okay. um, and I've actually used Netflix as an example of um, why we shouldn't do something to um, in meetings in the past because people wanted to throw loads of information onto a website and I've said well no you get the Netflix effect so you so is, actually there, is there any ideal number of choices that you want to have on a, on a web page that is immediately visible um, well, to be honest, I like to kind of keep information in chunks of three, to be honest, because your brain is kind of hardwired to understand information in chunks of three. Um, so, you know, I, I just think people want to be able to find information quickly and easily and, you know, get what they want out of that website. Um, so, you know, if you go kind of go back to the kind of the platform side of things, as long as the platform is delivering that experience and people can kind of, um, you know, enjoy what you're kind of giving out to them or find them to make relevant information or make the purchase in uh, an easy process, then it kind of it kind of works for them. Okay, okay, that's great. And um, what about the ex expectations of users over time? Has that changed a lot over the last few years as internet speed has increased, as pixel width of monitors has increased significantly and, and, and different mobile devices have obviously got faster as well. Do you think people's expectations of what a website web page 
offers has changed and, and will continue to change significantly? Oh, yeah, 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 completely, to be honest. I mean, people, um, you know, we've got so, so many kind of good quality devices in our hands on our, our desktops and, and, and television. Television, we want to be kind of using them to its best potential. Um, but really, if, if you kind of bring it back to the kind of psychological side of a website, you know, I really, I think as long as you keep things simple, you know, you don't really need to go... Um, mad with technology to be honest with websites as well you know keep it simple with the execution and keep it simple with the message um and it's, it's kind of a good quote from kind of seth gordon comes to mind um and that you shouldn't change something just because you're tired of it or you know for example your spouse gets tired of it you should change it when your accountant is tired of it you know so uh, don't what don't think about having to totally revamp your website every two or three years just because you think oh god technology I think we could do this we could do that um you know unless you're kind of a, a brand that kind of needs that kind of wow factor or a gimmick factor you know yeah if you are if you are one of those go for it but you will need to change your website regularly you know for the vast majority of us out there i'd just say kind of keep it simple um yeah and just yeah keep it simple <laughs> I think that's that's a really good um, tip just to end this um, the first part of the discussion on actually because um, there's so many um, website owners, um, content producers that see their own websites much more often than any of their, tired, their, their, their target customers and they're the ones that get fed up of it first. Oh but yeah, yeah. Just because you're fed up of it doesn't mean that your target customers are. And Yeah, yeah. I've fallen into that trap mm. many, many times to be honest as well, you know, so and it's kind of one that I've kind of since kind of uh, reading that quote, I've kind of forcibly kind of make myself just kind of stand back a little bit from it as well. Because, you know, like you say, we see something daily, you know, maybe four or five times. The vast majority of people won't. <laughs> well, let's segue into the second section of our discussion. So that focuses on Steve's thoughts on where digital marketing has been and where it's heading. So starting off with. Software I couldn't live without. So, Steve, what software do you currently use in your business that if someone took away from you, it would significantly impact your marketing success? Well, I suppose as a kind of a startup at the moment, it's very kind of like, um, I suppose very kind of business focused sort of things as in just to kind of make things kind of tick along on a daily basis. So things like Evernote for me is absolutely essential. Um, Asana is a kind of online task management tool. Um, which um, is essential for me to kind of actually work out what's going on for the week ahead. Um, Dropbox and Google Docs, if that was taken away from me, would be um, terrible. And from an actual kind of, um, you know, actually doing work side of things, um, Adobe Creative Cloud, you know, it's, um, it's definitely a mainstay of, of what I do on a daily basis. And, you know, with that, really, it's kind of Photoshop and design uh, Premiere. But mostly, uh, most recently, has been experience design for kind of making wireframes and kind of really kind of get into that kind of um, UX experience for a client before you get to the full design side. So um, experience design is that, is that from Adobe as well? Yeah, yeah, it's quite it's quite new. I believe for maybe about six months, twelve months at most. Um, yeah, but for me, it's been really good just to kind of visualize um, easily. Uh, the ideas that I've kind of got in my head and kind of show to clients in a nice, easy, digestible format. Okay, great. Well, it's always good to get recommendations that I haven't had before. <laughs> I think that's one of them. Um, but slightly more challenging question, and that is what piece of software don't you use, but you've heard good things about and you intend to try at some point in the near future? Oh, God, that's a good question. Um, You've stumped me, actually, to be honest, because um, what I tend to do, if, if I do get a recommendation, I tend to try and jump on it as, as soon as. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I've, I'm going to have to leave that one blank. Well, I'll tell you what, um, I'll leave it kicking in the back of your mind. Yeah, uh, we'll yeah, come yeah. back to it. Um, but um, you've also given us lots of other recommendations, so I'll include the links to all those um, in the show notes um, here at digitalmarketingradio.com. But let's move on to... I wish I would have. I'd like you to look back on the very first day that you're involved in trying to market a business online. What didn't you do so well? What do you wish that you would have done differently? Well, I suppose it's kind of uh, making assumptions without A-B testing is, is, quite, uh, is quite a big thing for me, to be honest. What, what software do you use for A-B testing? Uh, Visual Website Optimizer. Right. That's like, or uh, Optimizely or un Unbounce, depending on the uh, situation. 
Um, but yeah, I think so there was definitely when the, the latest iteration of the Learning People website went live, um, the kind of landing pages was, were, had a new tweak to the design. It was a bit more tastely designed, but boy, they didn't perform, to be honest. So it was kind of a, you know, it's a quick change it back to how it should be and sort of thing then. I mean, we eventually did get the changes in that we wanted, but we kind of got the data, you know, from working first. So, yeah, A-B testing. Yeah, definitely don't make assumptions. Never You're not as clever that. as you think you are. <laughs> <laughs> the this or that round. Okay, so this is the quick response round. Ten quick questions here, just two rows. Try not to think about the answer too much, and you're only allowed to say the word both on one occasion. Okay. Ready to go? Good, good, yeah. Email or Twitter? Email. Audio or video? Video. Affiliates or display advertising? Affiliates. Facebook or Google Plus? Facebook. Online press releases or one-on-one -on -one relations? One-on-one -on -one relations. Paid search or SEO? SEO. Email contact form or telephone number? Email contact form. Website or app? Website. Social subscriber or email subscriber? Email subscriber. And local marketing or global marketing? Local. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a significant struggle there for anything. I'm trying no, to not think too much. To um, a video fan rather than audio. Um, so you're not... Um, a listener of podcasts? Well, no, I, I am, to be honest. Um, I do, I do enjoy podcasts, podcasts which trip over my tongue more. But to kind of bring it back, actually, to the audio, what I love doing uh, is podcasts and audio books when I'm kind of uh, out my bike. Um, well, not on the bike so much because I'm doing more road work, and you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't have your headphones in the bike. Um, <laughs> But, you know, if you're out for a walk, I've, I've done a lot more walking this summer um, and kind of a podcast and audiobook is kind of really good to kind of keep you going along that. And I, what I tend to do is kind of get a business book, a uh, marketing book. Um, I'll have it on the iPad so I can take notes and then I'll listen to the audiobook as well so, as I'm walking alongside things. But, so audio is more for personal learning and video is more for your business? Um, no, because um, for video, what I love is, um, again, using Apple TV in the morning and watching things like a TED Talk, uh, just kind of a bit of inspiration and things like that as well. So I think there's definitely kind of a place for both, but... Um, you were forced yeah. to choose one. Yeah, but I would go for, okay, I would say video more. <laughs> but yeah, I, just because I think there's more scope for that moving forward. So if I was to give you $10,000 and you had to spend it over the next few days on a single thing to grow your business, what would you spend it on and how would you measure success? Well, that's a difficult thing really because i am just begin to um, plan my birthday party and I could just embezzle it and run away and have a real good party. But I think what I would do it on is spend it on video content, to be honest. 75% um, on video content and then 25% on inbound marketing too actually get people to see, to see that content. Um, and I think that kind of comes personally from where, how I kind of really want to market e-marketing e at the moment is to um, really kind of push that kind of uh, personal presence as well. Um, you know, as a kind of small business owner, you know, you, you kind of, you are your brand um, as well. And I think the best way to kind of really push forward with something like that is to kind of really push on with your uh, video content, uh, be that, you know, um, one minute segues into, you know, what is email marketing or kind of a longer piece that actually shows a, a presentation that you've done. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of um, drive that you can do with that. But again, you know, Kevin Costner was totally wrong. If you build it, it definitely won't come. Um, so 25% definitely has to go on inbound marketing. And the majority of that would probably go on Facebook advertising, to be honest, and email marketing. And it wouldn't, with Facebook, it wouldn't be from a revenue generation side of thing, but more of a kind of a brand growth side. So um, you know, kind of promotion for your video content then? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so for the actual video content, you were talking about yourself there, I think. So, so you're talking about having professionally produced videos of you explaining things to your audience? Or are you talking about having someone else actually in the video rather than you? 
Um, you can, a bit of both, to, to be honest. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that I could do something on video, but then again, if people don't like me on video, I've, I'll quickly take that lesson. Um, but I think it's more about having the e-marketing brand and um, essentially, you know, I'm kind of there to kind of help push that forward and you know there's nothing bigger than the brand and the individual isn't bigger than the brand of the company um but you know people buy into individuals rather than brands especially on the b2b level i would say to be honest so um yeah i think that's kind of a roundabout answer so <laughs> let's see if we can get back to this um one bit of software that you're thinking of or been aware of and you want to try at some point in the future so can you think of um that one piece of software that you've heard good things about and you intend to try at some point so I, I i'm totally stumped here this is this is a very scratch the head moment to be honest is um yeah no I can't, I can't think to be honest i i, I wish i had a clock here <laughs> that i could just keep on tipping until I, you came up with i've an got answer. a visual one in my head now to be honest but um but what, 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 what kind of software do you, do you think it would be? What, um, um, what thing are, are you either missing in your business or you think you need to offer to clients in the future as a service, maybe? Well, to be honest, I suppose the kind of the... Uh, I mean, this is something I, I, I do use, to be honest, is kind of things like uh, Moz.com or Analytics SEO side of things, but it's actually kind of... I suppose that intelligence side of things as well. If there was, um, if there was something in mind that kind of, kind of really, kind of pulled that kind of um, data into one that was, you know, what what, you, what I tend to find is there's kind of a lot of services where they kind of do certain things, but they don't quite do everything that I kind of want it to do. So I think I'm maybe inventing something rather than actually think thinking of a new thing for you. To be honest, yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's it's probably the challenge of attribution isn't it it's, it's attributing the true value of sources of traffic and and what they actually what impact they have on the bottom line uh, even if it's um not necessarily last click before purchase um a, a, a lot of these referring sources of traffic you know have some kind of impact and it's measuring it. And a lot of people are struggling with attribution so that's Hmm. That, 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 that's what I would take from your answer and that's, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going in the wrong direction there no 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 yeah we'll, we'll go with that one yeah yeah go with good. that yeah don't put me on any more pressure to come up with something else so. <laughs> okay let's um finish off with my number one takeaway so Steve you've offered a lot of um interesting perspectives and great advice in our, our conversation but what would you say is the number one takeaway so what was the single most important step that a listener needs to take away and implement in their business um, number one for me has to be kind of understanding your audience, really, and it's kind of having that kind of uh, meaningful connection with them as well. Um, it's about not going for a sale at any cost. It's about really kind of creating um, a website that kind of really caters towards a need, answers a question, creates content that people really want to, um, you know, digest and they really want to kind of share with people, you know, and if they kind of love your content, they'll love your brand. And then they'll they want to, they want to kind of purchase from you, and they want to kind of keep on coming back as well. So it's about yeah, understand your audience, meaningful connection, and kind of long term relationships. I love that. Create a website that caters towards a need because there's so many websites that I've landed on um, for different purposes, and. 10, 20 seconds later, I'm still not completely sure precisely what they do. So <laughs> I guess you need to articulate yeah. that need quite well. And um, if you do that, then... Oh, yeah, yeah, massively. I mean, again, from a psychological point of view, you know, it's your brain triggers in, what, 200 milliseconds, uh, you know, and you've got probably six seconds to really get someone's attention on your website. Otherwise, they're gone, you know, and yeah. Great stuff. Also, thanks to Steve and thanks to your listener too. If you enjoyed what Steve shared today, tell us what you think. An iTunes review is always good and I might even read it out in a future episode. And of course, if Twitter's your thing, at David Bain is my handle. So maybe it's your thoughts on this episode, maybe it's your thoughts on what we should discuss on a future episode. Whatever it is, it would be great to hear from you. But until we meet again, be fantabulous and do one thing that scares you. Thanks again, Steve. Great episode. Cheers, then. Thank you.